On September 11, 2001, America changed. Our mood and direction changed. And we've all been affected very differently depending on our age. How are generations shaped by history? How do they shape history? Why are today's 50-year-old boomers nothing like their parents or their kids? Why are today's teens so unlike Gen Xers? What makes generations so different in the children they raise, the products they buy, the careers they choose, the leaders they elect? How will the cycles of history affect your own life and your family, your business, your country? Meet the globally recognized expert who knows, Neil Howe. For the past 20 years, along with co-author William Strauss, Neil Howe has been the leading authority on American generations. He has written four books, all bestsellers, all widely used by businesses, colleges, government agencies, and political leaders of both parties. Why? Because again and again, his forecasts turn out to be right. His book, The Fourth Turning, published five years ago, recently ranked number 10 on Amazon's all books bestseller list. Why? Because Neil wrote stunningly accurate descriptions of how America would change in the way it recently has after the 9-11 attacks. Millennials Rising, the next great generation, states a powerful new positive message about today's college and high school students and the children coming up behind them. Neil's upbeat predictions used to be controversial, but not anymore. Generations is a landmark of a book, a full history of America told as a succession of generational biographies. It's a book used by college and high school classes and by national leaders. Bill Clinton kept generations on his Oval Office desk. Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh praised it widely. And Al Gore sent a copy to every member of Congress. And finally, Neil's best-selling 13th Gen introduced America to Generation X and has been very influential in the business world. Bill and Neil have received so many inquiries about these four books that they have co-founded a generational consulting company, LifeCourse Associates. Here is keynote speaker Neil Howe. Neil's books have always been bestsellers, but they jump to a new level of national attention with America's war on terrorism. They offer what the Washington Post called prescient answers to the question everybody is now asking. Joey, thank you. About four years ago, a book called The Fourth Turning was published. That book dealt with what its authors called the four shifts or turnings in America's national mood. They say they appear to occur about every 20 years or so. Applying this cyclical approach to history, the authors predicted the following. Shortly after the new millennium, they wrote, a sudden spark will catalyze a crisis mood in response to sudden threats that previously would have been ignored or deferred, but which are now perceived as dire. Neil Howe, co-author of The Fourth Turning, joins us now live from Washington to talk more about it. Sir, good evening to you. Good evening, Bill. Before we get to The Fourth Turning, quickly, what was one, two, and three, sir? <laughs> oh, in the turnings. Uh, the rhythm of American history in terms of these four turnings, the first turning is what we call a high. Uh, for instance, the American high after World War II, extending from about 1946, VJ Day, VE Day, to uh, the assassination of John Kennedy in the early 60s. A second turning is, uh, and, a, and I should say, a first turning is a time of, of, uh, of institutional strength, a little individualism, a great deal of conformity in the culture, and a great deal of confidence about the national direction. A second turning is a cultural and values upheaval of the kind that we had in the consciousness revolution from the early 60s to the early 80s. Uh, this is a time when people want to throw off all that social discipline and of course gave us events that a lot of uh, baby boomers my age remember so well coming of age. A third turning is in many ways the inverse of a first turning. It's a time when individualism is triumphant, institutions are weak and distrusted. Uh, these are famous for their decades of bad manners, for feeling of entropy in society, fragmentation, uh, rising worries about what holds us together as a nation. And history shows that third turnings are always followed by fourth turnings, which are the large uh, uh, hinge eras of crisis in American history. Earlier examples of fourth turnings would be the Great Depression, World War II, the Civil War, the American Revolution, and even other eras going back in, in both American and European history. All right, take it a bit forward, if you could, then. If that's the case, based on your theory about this crisis era, what comes out of it? How do Americans respond? 
Well, what drives these turnings is uh, generational aging. Generations are shaped young by history, they grow older, and in turn, they shape history. And now we see a new generation of uh, baby boomers taking over, presiding over America's institutions. Boomers have always had a reputation as fixated on values in the culture, uh, and that actually gives them, as leaders, mm. very little room for compromise, for negotiation. Uh, and we're beginning to see this, I think, in a lot of the boomer op-ed writers and SAS and people in the media, a great longing for um, a renewal of uh, community, certainty, black and white solutions to problems, uh, and, and also of younger generations coming up from behind them. We're also pushing this process along as they have pushed it before. I think one thing that's, that America feels beyond the, the, the shock of the physical dimensions of the tragedy, the, the buildings, uh, the, the lives lost, is a sense of disorientation. Uh, only a few weeks ago, everyone thought that America was headed indefinitely toward individualism, uh, uh, better markets, more mobility, more openness, uh, kind of a carnival culture, less regulation, less government. And now, today, all mm. of those uh, all of those trends seem to be in reverse. I mean, high-tech, yeah. high-tech culture, and then we have right. uh, our planes taken over by someone with knives. Huh. Neil, I want to get to this quickly so I can show viewers again another excerpt from your book, and it reads by the following. I don't know if we can put it up on the screen or not. It says, don't think you can escape the fourth turning the way you might today distance yourself from news, national politics, or even taxes you don't feel like paying. History warns that a crisis will reshape the basic social and economic environment that you now take for granted. Again, the question, what comes out of this as we go forward? Well, let me give you one clue, that mm -hmm. if you look back historically at the great fourth turnings of our history, you find that the the event that touches it off can always be predicted in advance. Many people didn't, but we could always foresee it. People did foresee a terrorist event. People did foresee a stock crash in the late, uh, in the late 20s. People did foresee a, an abolitionist president in the, in the 1850s. But what comes out of the crisis, that is to say, what climaxes the mood toward the end of the crisis era is something totally beyond our imagination. We do think we will redefine ourselves as a nation, as a society, and that many of the political and economic institutions could be drastically altered with events that could, that could speed up history in a way that we haven't been accustomed no. to seeing for a long time. Fascinating stuff. We'll see where we go from here. Neil Howe, author, co-author of The Fourth Turning. Much appreciate your thoughts today. Thank you. The Wall Street Journal said, one of the best efforts to give us an integrated vision of where we are going. Neil's perspective on the rhythms of history is based on his penetrating understanding of generations, who they are, what motivates them, and where they are headed. Take, for example, the GI generation, Americans who served in World War II. Now, when you look at this life cycle, you recognize a vivid personality type. Above all, they've always stood for civic virtue and optimism. The first members of this generation are reaching puberty right around World War I. America had its first Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H'ers, Campfire Girls. In the early 1920s, we had our first Miss America. In the late 1920s, we had our first All-American Heroes with Charles Lindbergh. Is it any accident that when this generation finally started retiring, we invented a new name for old people in America? What did we call them? Senior Citizens. We never called old people senior citizens before. When they were young, people liked to talk about happy kids, like Pollyanna and Little Orphan Annie. They came of age with Somewhere Over the Rainbow. They came to the presidency with JFK. What was his motto? Let's get this country moving again. I'm sure a lot of you recall uh, Ronald Reagan's second inaugural, right? Morning again in America. And if you go to a planned care community, GIs really don't like words like nursing homes, but a planned care community. And as people in their 80s, what they like most about their life there, they'll probably say things like, we like it here because everyone's happy and busy, right? Happy and busy. Now, they've obviously exercised huge influence on politics. When they were young, they voted in the New Deal. They've occupied the White House longer than any other U.S. generation. The acronym GI literally means general issue or government issue. And of course, that, they've always stood squarely for both, often being both contributors to and recipients of what government is doing. In their 
Taste for organizations, they always prefer the A-frame organizational pyramid, right? One person at the top giving orders, everyone fitting in, taking orders down below, paying their dues, doing the hard work and getting rewarded later. And they're, uh, the marketing messages we respond to. I'm sure we all remember that great ad that was invented in radio in the 1940s, became very popular in the 1960s. You can trust your car to the man who wears the star, right? The big, bright Texaco star. That ad says almost anything you want to know about GIs. Maleness, bigness, trust in authority. Even primary colors, right? A red star. Drove the next couple generations to prefer pastels. USA Weekend says Neil has a startling vision of what the cycles of history predict for the future. Members of the silent generation include Dick Cheney, Sandra Day O'Connor, Colin Powell, and Woody Allen. Well, let's move on. The silent generation. I'm sure you've heard the term. Today in their late 50s, 60s, early 70s. The silent started out as the children of crisis. When they were growing up, People were fighting wars, making tremendous sacrifices, fighting and dying on their behalf. The style of child rearing, which is already becoming more protective for the GIs, approached the point of total suffocation. And when they entered adulthood, right after the war was over, in the late 40s, they were needled as the silent or quiet generation on college campuses, partly because they kept their heads down during the McCarthy era. They didn't want anything to go on their permanent record. They wanted to work within the system rather than change the system. In 1949, Fortune magazine ran a cover story. It was called The Cla College Class of 49. It's the first silent generation class after all the GIs had come and left the college campuses. And the subtitle of the story was, on the front cover, was The Class of 49, and the subtitle was Taking No Chances. They found that the silent their first questions for employers were about pension plans. None of them wanted to start their own business. They all wanted to join huge employers, you know, GE, Westinghouse, government. And the same approach to their married lives. This is a generation that wanted at the earliest possible age to make the longest possible term commitments. And so they got married and had kids at a younger age than any other generation in American history, an often uh, unrealized fact. Well, um, one way you could actually define who they are is by saying that this generation was born just too late to be war heroes and just too early to be youthful free spirits during the consciousness revolution. That sort of defines their location in history. Economically, it's been a very good location, right? They got on the post-war escalator of economic prosperity right after the war, been riding it ever since. They're small in number too, so they probably will escape serious cuts in their Medicare and Social Security. Boomers probably won't be so lucky, as I'm sure that many of you are aware. They're the only living generation that can half agree, along with Woody Allen here, that 80% of life is just showing up, right? Just show up, you'll ride up with it. But in many other respects, they've paid a price for that early conformity. As they've grown older, a lot of this generation has had to invent the art of what they call, along with Gail Shee, Daniel Levinson, and many others, the art of the midlife passage. That effort to recapture the youthful adventure and catharsis you missed the first time around. So you find many members of this generation started to take more risks at an advanced age, changing careers, changing spouses. And, um, I mean, you look at some of the messages by members of this generation, a late wave member of this generation, Bob Dylan. Remember that line, I was older then, I'm younger than that now. Or the line from Elvis Presley, I've spent a lifetime waiting for the right time. It doesn't make sense to another generation. Boomers never waited for anything. Boomers are going to continue to have a huge influence on marketing trends. Um, as always, they're going to be attracted to appeals to do the right thing, you know, buy Safeco insurance, do the right thing, or things that appeal to their taste for the traditional, the classic, the genuine, the honest, all these very potent boomer words. One of my favorite uh, boomer ads that I've noticed in the Washington area in the past few years is the ad for the Washington Post. Um, it goes like this, subscribe to the Washington Post, because if you don't get it, 
you don't get it. Now that's perfect for boomers. What boomer is going to want to admit that he doesn't get it? I've, I've asked extras, a lot of them don't even understand the appeal of that ad. Another interesting kind of ad is uh, the ad for Saturn cars, which came about, sort of rose up in the early, uh, in the mid 90s, and has really spread its influence to a lot of different advertising apps for boomers. It's really original approach. Buy this car, not because it's a good car, but because good people make this car. Again, other generations looking, what are you talking about? There's also something called the art of what marketers call the art of nonism, which is trying to advertise whatever it is the person is not going to consume, right? So you're going to be buying your no, non-caffeine cola, your uh, no nitrate meat, your no color gasoline. That way the boomer can be consuming but thinking of what he's not consuming while he's doing it. Per perfect. So where are boomers going from here? past midlife as they reach old age? Well, we predict that boomers, just as their GI generation parents dominated political and, cult political and economic institutions late in life, boomers are going to dominate the culture late in life, as they always have. And um, I mean, you already know that even in their 80s, they're still going to be hosting all those radio shows. They're still going to be monopolizing all those style sections of the national newspapers. And even those 1,200 golden oldies, they're going to be playing them on all the radio stations until they finally pass away. At which point, younger generations would probably have some huge band bonfire of celebration. One thing, though, to remember about boomers is that they're following so far very much the pattern of the prophet-type generation, born after a crisis, indulged in childhood, attacking the institutions of elders, going into this period of midlife, kind of values cultivation. In every case, most recently with the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Great Depression, and World War II, this kind of generation, when entering elderhood as elder leaders, has led the country into another crisis. And uh, it'll be a time of both opportunity and a time of danger. And we talk about this probably in greatest detail in our last book, which is The Fourth Turning, what that implies. A period that will probably start later in this decade and climax at some, some kinds of events around the year 2020, at least according to the pattern that we've observed in the past. But the danger is always there. I mean, think about it. Of all of today's living generations, which is most likely to someday risk blowing up the world just to prove a point? Newsweek said this is a provocative, erudite, and engaging analysis of the rhythms of American life. Here's Neil talking about Generation X, born from 1961 to 1981. It's often said that this is a generation of materialists. Is that true? Well, if you look, this is the famous uh, poll results taken by Austin and other professors at UCLA of college freshmen over the past 30 years. They, they have a famous set of two questions. What's the most important goal of life, developing a meaningful philosophy or being financially successful? Well, as you can see, back when boomers in the late 60s, when boomers were freshmen, it was two-thirds, one-third, a meaningful philosophy of life. Say it's two-thirds, one-third the other way. You know, that's a huge shift. Two-thirds, one-third. In politics, you'd consider that a landslide. But that's what you sometimes see with generational attitudes. Of course, exes have a, an interpretation of why they feel that way. They feel they never got the basics in family life, community, education that boomers had. They've had to spend a lot more energy just making simple things in their life work again, just getting by, just surviving. They haven't had the same time or money to waste in mind expansion, which is the way they imagine boomers spent their youth. Are they a generation of risk-taking individualists? Well, again, you'd have to say the numbers sort of support that. They're far more likely than other generations to be buying lottery tickets, to be doing gambling. Gambling on college campuses, sports gambling, is huge today. They, don't, they prefer on the job not a fixed pay, but rather commissions, piecework, special deals, temping, freelancing, stock options, of course, if they're available. And they change jobs a lot, huge amount of income mobility, always looking for the main chance. You see, the way extras see life, it's like living in a valley. They're on one side, everything they want's on the other side, but there's no bridge anymore connecting you. 
There's no step-by-step -step process in which those things will naturally come to you. You need a huge slingshot. You've got to just kind of shoot yourself across. One dollar more or less where I am isn't going to matter. And we look, you ask people, what's your favorite word for work? And you ask boomers, and they'll say career. Or even better boomer word would be something like vocation. That's because boomers think of themselves as together people. Career defines who you are. It's part of your life. The favorite extra word for work is job. Job. A job is not part of your life. It's an instrument. It's something you do in order to get a life. And I spend a lot of time with groups sometimes in these workplace issues. And I think that that single misunderstanding, among others, is what separates and causes a lot of emotional antagonism between 20-somethings and 40-somethings in a lot of offices that I've seen. What about their attitude toward politics? Are they an apathetic generation? Well, again, the numbers would say yes, the lowest youth voting rates that we've ever measured. But it doesn't mean this generation doesn't care. As I'm sure a lot of you are aware, this generation likes to participate in civic life one-on-one. -on -one. They're very cynical of big institutions. They don't want to help you know, national parties. They don't want to give the United Way. But if they can ladle out soup at a soup kitchen, build a house, you know, Habitat for Humanity house, they meet the person they help, they feel good about it, they know they aren't tricked, and then they can forget about it and go home. A very non-boomer approach to altruism. The president of MIT once likened the extra civic spirit to that of the Lone Ranger. So they come into town, do a good deed, leave a silver bullet, and move on. Of millennials rising, the National Education Association said it's hard to resist the book's hopeful vision for our children and future. Many of the theories they wrote about in their two previous books, Generations and the 13th Gen, have indeed come to pass. How are today's kids different? The truth about America's millennial generation may surprise you. I'm sure there's a lot that you already know about this generation demographically. They are a larger generation than Xers, cohort by cohort, because we've seen a fertility rebound, something that's been called the baby boomlet or the echo boom. People, parents want to have more of this generation, partly what actually defines who they are. And they've also benefited from a huge surge in immigration by Xer and boomer parents. This is also added to their numbers. Also, as I'm sure that many of you have heard, this is, without question, the most diverse generation, racially and ethnically. One out of three millennial kids is either non-white or Hispanic, actually slightly more, about 36%. One out of five has at least one parent who's an immigrant. And amazingly, one out of 10 has at least one parent who is not a U.S. citizen. But I want to emphasize here just a couple things you probably haven't thought about, and that is the way in which this generation is beginning to follow the pattern of what we call the hero archetype. They arrived at a time just after the consciousness revolution, just after a spiritual awakening, when, as always in such times, attitudes towards kids begin to move back toward safety, protection, and structure. You see a lot of markers that point to the early 80s as a real threshold. That's when we first started to see, out of nowhere, a new kind of bumper sticker, remember? Baby on board. And a new kind of car, a minivan designed expressly for kids. It's when you started seeing a huge amount of books and articles come out about how poorly kids had been treated over the past earlier 10 or 15 years. And how it was important to treat kids uh, differently. It's when the child devil <laughs> Uh, movie genre ended, and you suddenly had a much more positive depiction of kids in the, in the national, in the popular culture. And uh, suddenly you had uh, actresses and celebrities flaunting their pregnancies. It's when you saw a child abuse hysteria energize the public to support all kinds of government action and political priorities for kids. So today we're just kind of awash in that, right? V-chips, curfews, year-round schooling, zero tolerance. Helmets for practically every purpose you can think of. The TV programming for kids has changed drastically in a way that reflects this difference. The flagship uh, TV show for Xers was Sesame Street, you probably recall. Emphasis on blunt urban realism 
And the emphasis was all on how good kids are all different. Let's explore the differences between kids. I am me, you are you, that kind of thing. With millennials, what is it? Barney and Friends, the big purple dinosaur. It's relentlessly upbeat. There's not a bad word ever said on that show. There's not a bad emotion ever expressed. And the emphasis is always on what kids have in common. And in fact, teamwork and collective action is a huge theme already in this generation. National standards are the buzzwords in the schools. Collaborative learning, team teaching, service learning in the community. Neil's positive message about the rising generation is shifting the whole debate over the future of today's kids and is persuading older Americans to focus less on alleged shortcomings and more on giving them challenges worthy of their full potential. Shifting gears now, you've heard of the baby boomers and generation Xers. Now there's the teen generation of the millennials. The generations are outlined in a new book, Millennials Rising. And joining me now from Washington is the co-author of that book, Neil Howe. Good morning, Neil. Good morning. Well, let's go ahead and define millennials. What, what does it mean? Well, we're looking at um, uh, kids who are today, Americans who are today age 18 and under, uh, born, in, uh, uh, born since 1982. Their leading edge is uh, the celebrated high school class of 2000, and uh, they're just, uh, uh, some of them are just entering college as freshmen this year. All right, so what's the main difference among millennials and the baby boomers and the Generation Xers? Well, the generation they're following, of course, is Generation X, uh, those who were born in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, uh, one of the things we're seeing with, with millennials is uh, their behavior is improving a lot. Um, since the mid-1990s, we've seen an enormous reduction, for instance, in youth violence. Uh, murder rates, uh, 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 school violence, uh, violent crime, these are all down by one-half or, or two-thirds. The teen, pre the teen uh, birth rate is the lowest ever measured. The teen abortion rate is the lowest since Roe v. Wade in 1973. And now we've heard uh, very recently the the uh, uh, drug use rate among uh, high school students uh, under age, uh, age 18 and under is down 21% over the last two years. Uh, their SAT scores are the highest now since, uh, since uh, 1973. So we have a lot of good news coming out about these kids, and, and that raises some questions. Why? Why these kids? Why now? And what does it say about who they are and how different they are from the generations before them? And that's really the the, the broader questions, too, are the ones that we ask in this book, aside from just saying who they are, but why they are. Forget Generation X and Y, for that matter, says the Washington Post. Strauss and Howe make short work of most media myths that shape our perceptions of kids these days. To inquire if Neil Howe is available to inspire your next conference with a fresh, unique message, please call Life Course Associates, 866-537-4999 or write to authors at lifecourse.biz.